Hey, it's Mike here, and today, monkey pox, or as I think it should be called, squirrel pox, which we'll get to in a bit, but really this is about using knowledge to lower anxiety, and throughout the research process, I definitely lowered my amount of concern about this virus. However, I still have a healthy amount of concern. It was probably just a little bit too much to start with. With all the crap we've been through with COVID, I was hoping this would kind of be another like H1N1 where it sounds all scary and then nothing really happens. But I am in Barcelona in Spain and I saw that viral headline about that guy in Madrid, Spain who had monkeypox on the subway and I was like, oh crap. But he didn't even have monkeypox. He had another disease which highlights the hysteria. And then cases appeared to be doubling again and again. And so in the US, we even had a doubling of cases between July 25th and the time that I'm recording this of 3,500 to 7,000 cases. So I started getting a little bit of deja vu or deja flu. Obviously it's not a flu, but you get the joke. And then three pretty populated states declared a state of emergency. And now the president has declared a state of emergency. So I was like, I guess I'm not making a fun eating vegan food in Barcelona vlog this time. But it's also worth mentioning the first piece of information that calmed me down a bit because I was made to believe that the case fatality rate was quite high, like up to 10% on this, but it's been lower in recent years in Africa, and then this international outbreak is even lower. We're gonna get into the exact numbers because there is a lot of nuance there. It's still a threat, but let's just go. This video is sponsored by Monkey Pods. Just swing into one of these cryogenic chambers and wake up when this whole monkey pox thing is eradicated. What year, you ask? We don't know. And disclaimer, if society collapses, we might forget about you. Isn't that bananas? Buy yours now. Before a more real disclaimer, I think we have to set expectations that any recommendations and particular claims about a virus like this, as we learned from COVID, is open to change. The virus will change. Rates of fatality can change and on and on. So just be aware of that. It's not always somebody being wrong or a conspiracy. Anyway, let's get to the virus itself in the background. This is a orthopox virus, which means that it is of the same family of viruses that smallpox is. Thankfully, it is much less lethal and we eradicated smallpox in the 80s, thankfully. You know, largely do, you know, from this chart, as you can tell from vaccines. However, smallpox is still really relevant here because a lot of older people still have the smallpox vaccine, which means they have resistance. And we're talking about, you know, ballpark figure about 80, 85% resistance to monkeypox from that vaccine. So as that population ages out of the planet onto another plane, uh, younger people who don't have that vaccine are more susceptible, so the population becomes more susceptible. And no, unfortunately, if you had chicken pox, you are not immune to the virus as I originally hoped. I'm like, can I get some payback from that? It is called monkey pox, which is a bit of a misnomer. Yes, it was discovered in monkeys in Denmark in the 1950s, not Africa. These were lab monkeys in Europe. And it's been around for a thousand years, at least probably likely hosted by particular rodents, which we will get into, which brings us to the origin. The official origin is that the moment that Harambe was killed, the monkey gods became angry and unleashed this virus upon the world. Oh God, please don't become a conspiracy theory. Harambe is an ape. Anyway, let's get into the actual origins because once again, it appears that this is most likely originally from people consuming animals, in particular, again, wild animals, actually. The first human case was a child in the Democratic Republic of Congo in the 70s, and then in the 80s, one of only two species in the wild to be recorded to have monkey pox was found to have monkey pox, and that is the rope squirrel, which according to UCLA is among the most frequently consumed bushmeat animals in the Congo. So maybe squirrel pox is a more accurate name. It still could be another rodent that harbors it as well, or is the origin. And I wanna say I'm not just a vegan who points to animal exploitation as the cause of everything. Hey, Nigeria just recently banned bushmeat hunting to prevent the spread of monkeypox. Gosh, Nigeria is such a biased vegan. Anyway, speaking of Nigeria, it seemed to be pretty bad at spreading from human to human until about five years ago. 
largely in Nigeria, where the cases seemed to go up, like transmission was faster. And while monkeypox actually did make its way into the US in 2003, where it killed 70 people from some illegal pet trading, it is generally spreading from human to human now. That appears to be what's happening with this international outbreak. As of now, this international outbreak is well over 20,000, which from this chart you can see is an unusually high number looking in past years. And heck, Africa only has like 350 cases still. So now we're gonna get into symptoms and how this is spreading now. And that brings us to the New York Department of Public Health who says, it can be from direct contact with monkeypox sores or rashes on an individual who has monkeypox. And I would love to see future studies on how much contact actually needs to occur for how long, but I think we can chill out just a little bit in terms of being afraid of getting near any single human being because as the WHO says, quote, you are extremely unlikely to have monkeypox if you have not been in close contact, such as touching their skin or sharing bedding with someone who has monkeypox. And I think the natural fear is that you're just gonna kind of rub up against somebody walking by really briefly and get it. But to the Kaiser Family Foundation, they say, quote, it's important to know that this virus can enter broken skin and penetrate mucous membranes like in the eyes, nose, mouth, genitalia, and anus. So it's not just going to burrow into normal skin. There has to be something open there. And we'll get into precautions for that later. But back to the New York paper, quote, respiratory droplets or oral fluids from someone with monkeypox, particularly those who have close contact with someone or are around them for a period of three hours or more. So this is not coronavirus. It doesn't appear to be as respiratory dominated, still a possibility. And also a unique possibility here is again, infected people's bed sheets sort of drying out and being shaken out and then having some sort of clouds of it and breathing it in. So obviously masks. Now I wanna quickly get into the sort of timeline of the disease. It can range, but it seems that between six to 13 days are required for incubation from exposure until you're actually going to get symptoms. We then have what they call the invasion period. Do we have to call it something that's scary? This is zero to five days where you get a fever and headaches and muscle aches and general tiredness. I have heard about you know three day long fevers being not too uncommon. You then have the skin eruption phase, which is you know one to three days after that fever sets in. So the fever precedes that. And this is of course, Pustule type lesions often of, of varying sizes. Some of them can get pretty big. You know, I've seen some that might be about half of an inch in those pictures. And of course it attacking the eye can lead to blindness. And it's also worth mentioning that this is a quote, self-resolving disease, which means in about two to four weeks, the body's just going to fight it off if all goes well which are scarring, I suggest not looking at them, but this can be you know, essentially all over the body, the face, you know, the torso, et cetera. And it can also be in the eyes, on the eyeball, and of course, throughout the digestive tract, like in your mouth and butt. And from this New England Journal of Medicine study on 16 countries for this outbreak, in terms of the distribution, the anogenital area was 73% of people, trunk, arms, and legs was 55% of people, the face was 25, and the palms and soles were about 10%. We'll get more into the demographics of that in a bit, but it's a little bit of a relaxing figure to hear that two thirds of them had 10 or less of these lesions. So most people aren't gonna be covered from head to toe. As with many other viruses, the case fatality rate, you know, the percentage of people who are recorded positive than dying is quite shifty. You might've heard one to 10%, which is kind of confusing, but this depends on where they're measuring it. For example, in Central Africa, it's been recorded as high as 10%. And then in Western Africa, it's been 3%. And then it appears to have gone down to around 1% in recent years. But as of August 1st, for this whole international outbreak, we're talking about a bit over 20,000 cases and 10 deaths, which puts us down at 0.05% case fatality. However, a lot of those cases are gonna be going on for a while. You know, this can be a several week process. And the joke about this is everybody on the internet is way more concerned about getting like scars on their face than they were of dying from COVID anyway. And like with post COVID, I would say there's a major concern beyond just dying. Of course, you have the blindness I mentioned, you have the scarring, you also have extreme amounts of pain as well. People saying it's the worst they've ever had in their life, being hospitalized just for pain. 
And I also think it's really important to understand who is getting this disease right now and their age and risks as well, because it's unique and the situation from this New England Journal of Medicine paper is that this is predominantly, we're talking 95% linked to sexual activity and 98% among men who have sex with men. And in this, we're talking about people at an average age of 38. So I have to mention right now that the fatality rate is likely higher in children. If this shifts demographics, then it's gonna be a completely different situation. And I would consider this a seminal study because 29 out of 32 semen samples tested positive for monkeypox. I will say that we don't know if it can actually spread that way yet. And finally, just don't look at figure two if you open that study thing of nightmares. But jokes aside, I do feel absolutely horrible that this is targeting the same demographic that had to deal with the tragedy of AIDS. It's just really, it's it, a little bit of a loss for words there, but I think this will spawn several myths. First of which, that this is just a STI, sexually transmitted infection. It absolutely is not. Obviously through sexual activities you can get it, but just normal skin rubbing could also theoretically do it. And also we have the issue of just generally homophobic people in the same way that we originally thought in the US, certain people thought that COVID was just gonna be some Chinese virus and sort of stay over there and that it was in some developing world. It's not gonna affect us the same way. You know, it's foolish to think that an infected subgroup of people is going to be the last subgroup. So to all the homophobic people out there like Nelda from Kaflafi, Ohio. Careful, your homophobia could turn into boils on your face. And another issue that several people have raised is that if there's enough homophobia around this issue, like if a straight white male gets this who's homophobic or doesn't want to be seen as gay, then they're going to A, lie about it, B, not get tested, and then C, spread it more effectively through the community, you know, by pretending they don't have it and continuing life as usual and touching everything. And we're talking about groups around this. I think a particular vulnerable group could be if this spreads into children, especially playing sports in school. We're talking about things like wrestling and sports that share a bunch of equipment. And as I mentioned, the fatality rate could be worse. So we have to keep a strong eye on that. I also think we need to be mindful of discrimination against people who have pre-existing skin conditions like psoriasis or even just acne. You know, learn the difference between these and keep a level head. All right, let's move right along. You might be thinking, what if I am concerned that monkeypox is on some surface that I'm around? Is there something you can do? Well, the EPA does have a list, sort of like emergency disinfectant list that based off previous research should work. That list will be linked below and has a bunch of different cleaning products, mentions the names of the products as well. Just make sure that it says it's good for tier one viruses, which they are considering monkeypox one of. Next, I wanna cover some just points that I've never heard anybody bring up. I'm just gonna float them as sort of concerns or strategies that people should maybe keep in mind, could keep in mind if they want. And these are risk of contact, like if you have micro cuts from shaving, that would of course make you way more vulnerable than somebody who doesn't have that. So it's something to be mindful of in terms of the broken skin thing. We also have things like laundromat air. I mean, if this is heating up in an area you're in, and you go into a laundromat where people are fluffing out a lot of blankets per hour, you know, I would definitely wear a mask there. And then again, just the general athletic concern. I mean, people who are again sharing equipment or who are in a contact sport, like again, wrestling that gets really close, that is something worth considering. You know, if somebody has like an open wound or a cut, maybe you should wear a Band-Aid over that cut, even if you don't need to. And then I'm in Barcelona and I see a lot of things like scooter sharing services that come with helmets. I mean, putting on a helmet that rubs hard against an area that is shared by other people and you just gotta be thinking in those terms, especially if it's in your area. All right, now let's get into my predictions. Maybe they'll be inaccurate, maybe they won't. <laughs> Let's just, why not? Anyway, we have the first one, which is I think that this is again going to spring a lot of conspiracy theories up, whether they are for just the ad revenue of the people that create them or for political gain. And that of course ends up obstructing actual public health messaging. And that trap door of denial that usually occurs with those conspiracies can just open up a nice pathway for disease to spread. But I wanna optimistically predict that this won't lead to lockdowns just because it requires prolonged contact or direct contact, which can be avoided 
a lot more easily than staying six feet away from each other. And then my other prediction slash hope, I'm not a fortune teller or anything, is that we will be able to stay under 500,000 cases and like 250 deaths in that area. I really hope that's the case. You know, if variables don't change, and I hope it doesn't even get that high, obviously. All right, in the end, I think that people should not be panicking, but people should also be taking this seriously because we could let it become something out of hand or we could nip it in the butt if we work together. We have to once again remind ourselves that any information in this video that anybody's telling you right now is not set in stone, even if it's accurate because things change, viruses evolve, and hopefully this won't evolve very much. Unfortunately, we've already seen several mutations that have probably made this more mass infection possible. And then finally, once again, it looks like the origin is from eating animals, in particular wild animals. And no, I do not blame the hungry African people in the 70s who were eating squirrels, but I will continue to blame people who learn more and more about these origins and yet continue to support the industries, whether it's chicken farming, which caused the 1918 pandemic, or wild animal farming or eating or whatever, I will blame you. And finally, I'm just majorly sorry to anybody that has to deal with the pain of this disease and the fear of, of a newer disease that not that much is known about. Thankfully, again, the case fatality rate is coming in at lower than I thought it originally was, which is great. And finally, I looked at figure two for you guys and got scarred and will have nightmares. So maybe just leave a little like for that one. Thank you very much and thanks for watching. Again, feel free to subscribe and see you in the next one. Later.